Hey, it's Mike Tyson. And Hot Boxing is on vacation now. We'll be back soon with some hardcore off the wall sh real soon. For now, just enjoy this rerun. This was one of my favorite episodes right here. Me and Eminem. Check it out. Dean Geislinger walks up to me. He's like, yo, man, you got one of those CDs? And I was like, yeah. And I kind of just tossed it to him, right? And didn't think nothing of it. I didn't know that Dean worked with Jimmy Iovine. So he gave it to Jimmy. Jimmy gave it to Dre. And I get the call and I'm like, oh, shit. you know, this is about to happen. Wow. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to an on the motherfucking road hot boxing. I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. And we got motherfucking Eminem in the house. I'm Shady in the house. Yeah, you you got you got Marshall right now. Oh, no, Shady's Marshall. like this on. Yeah, it's on? on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so excited, man. I I I uh, if I start getting weird, just stop me. <laughs> it's all good, man. Weird is good on this show. Okay. Yeah, we get a little weird. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I I know we met at Kimmel, and I didn't get a chance to like really, we didn't get a chance to talk. You know, I'm such a f huge fan thank you. i can't even like thank you i can't even like i feel like a kid right now <laughs> man like <laughs> this is crazy i remember i listened to your first album it was a long time ago it really didn't go nowhere but i listened to it. i listened to it and i heard you talk about cuss oh yeah 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 the first album i believe it was yeah man i've i've seen like pretty much every documentary every uh, every fight i've seen like everything that's available, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm humbled right now. I feel like I feel like a kid again. Why do you? Why did you become who you were? Why did I become who I was? Yeah. Um. Why would I, you want to do this? You know. Um. I just loved hip hop growing up as a kid. I just, you know, it was like like it it just it spoke to me more than any other music I had ever heard before. You know from early like Ice T to Fat Boys um and then LL Cool J uh Run DMC Beastie Boys and it just like I don't know it was like I did, I didn't I didn't first first I was a fan of the music you know what I'm saying before I even thought about rapping LL Cool J was the one who made me like first start writing rhymes and I was like 12, 13 maybe. And it sucked, <laughs> you know, I wasn't good, but like I had to keep practicing and practicing and practicing. I, I gave it up for a little while, then I started again back when I was like 15 and started being able to kind of put songs together. And then I just was like, I'm starting to, I, I was never really good at much else, you know? So I just, I don't know. Once I found out I was decent at something, I just kind of, focused and just you know went for it that's interesting because i remember i was i was in a juvenile detention center and we heard um the i'm not we heard rappers delight we said what the fuck is that yeah how could it be because we heard it <laughs> in the streets in our neighborhood but we never thought it'd be on the radio yeah and it was on the radio we like what the hell was that and we were just all blown away the fear yeah. that our music was being played on the radio yeah you know. How about the fact that Rapper's Delight was like a seven, seven some odd minute song? Yeah. It was and the radio played it. They yeah. played it from top to bottom. Like It was so popular. It was all off the hook. Mm-hmm. And then Nucleus, Jam On It. Jam On It. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, man. Doom, doom, doom. Yeah. That was like, yeah, I never really, I never really like got into rock and roll or uh, R&B or blues or anything like that. I just like i you know i'd listen to songs on the radio or whatever my mom was listening to in the car but once hip-hop came along i just felt like man this is like i don't know i just was all in yeah um hip-hop was a oh, I, I just can't even imagine it. It, made, it gave you pride yeah you know like us being the, like um book the prototype of hip-hop at the beginning of it it gave us pride to know that our music people talk the way we talk with being on television being on um the radio and stuff yeah yeah it gave us a lot of pride back then yeah and it's uh, it, it's also like it's just such a if you think about like 
how hip hop from the start of it. Well, I was there. Yeah, and then it just like police oh. out in the front of every hip hop club. You got the the whole New York police station out in front of the club. Yeah, it was just it was just. And if you went to a hip hop club and you were marked, people would say, "Oh, yes." Even in your neighborhood, you know, hardcore bebop hip hop, and this what the f you fucking with those niggas for, yeah. Mike? That's what they used to say. What you fucking with them for? Even people <laughs> in the neighborhood, what you fucking with them niggas for? But those was our people. All the criminals, the thieves, we all listen to hip hop. The yeah. money makers and everything, the, the you know, the the killers, the robbers, the, the all the fuck street urchins. We all listen to that. That's what we listen to. And as soon as we listen to, we enjoy it. But we spot, but we um surveying everything. We're looking at the people with the jewelry, the coats, the clothes, and looking yeah. nice. And then we're getting ready to get them after the club is over. Yeah. And that's just what hip hop was about. All the robbers and thieves were coming there to enjoy the music, but after it was over, we going to rob. Yeah. And that's what hip hop was about. Yeah. Once Breakin' came out, the movie Breakin', and then Crush Groove and Beat Street, man, it was like, yeah, it just put, it put the whole, it put the whole culture of hip hop on the map, in a in a in a, in a place where you could see with the music. You know what I'm saying? You had the visual, and you had you you, you know graffiti. You must, like that's you must say this is my way out when you saw that. When you I didn't getting good. You must say this is my way out. When I started, yeah. When I started being able to put songs together, and I started like, uh, you know, figuring out like, well, I might be almost as good as that rapper. You know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna keep going. And then I start, you know, just I learned so much. Like I I, I studied. How old were you when that started? Hip hop, uh, the first time I heard anything, my uncle Ronnie uh, brought over a tape of Breaking, the Breaking soundtrack, and it had Reckless on it from Ice T. Once upon a time, a DJ's task was just to play records. What more could you ask? I know, and I was. I know colors, colors. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Colors was hard. Uh, yeah, my, my uncle Ronnie started liking rap before I did and then he kind of introduced me to it and right around that time I think yeah, the movie had just come out and I saw the movie and I was like yo this is I love it mm. and it just I don't know it just spoke to me in the way that no other music had spoke to me before I understand that how old were you when you first started putting it out there like started rapping or doing rap battles? Well, I had a weird trajectory. Like I I was afraid, like I, I was afraid early on, like 15, 16 years old, I was afraid that to go into any clubs or anything like that to say my raps because I felt like I wasn't good enough yet. Mm. So I had to get to a certain spot. And then I was trying to like, I was just making songs and uh, one day I got a call from my boy Proof, and he was like, yo, you need to come up to the hip hop shop. And I was like, what is what is the hip hop shop? And he's like, yo, just come to the hip hop shop, write something, come up here. And Proof like, remember Proof Nani, he, 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 uh, he ran shit in Detroit. We, we, like me and him came up together and we came up rapping together, but he would kind of go do his own thing. And then I'd, I'd be working like at uh, factories and stuff like that. And Proof was out there like on the grind and he started making connections. And then he met Jay Dilla, uh, Slum, yeah, Slum Village. Um, and a lot of the early Detroit hip hop that was like exploding onto the scene, like Proof was such a part of that. And I got a chance to, when I went to the hip hop shop, I was like, what the fuck? He was like, yo, I'll clear everybody out. I have like 10 people, right? And you rap in front of them. And if they don't like you, you know, they're gonna tell you they don't like you. <laughs> if they if they do like you and they fuck with you, then they're, you know. So I went there, I said the rap, I got some people jumping around and shit, and I was like, okay, this might be it for me. And then that's when we start having battles at the hip hop shop. Mm. And we was having like a battle every, what, couple months or something. Yeah, every, every, yeah, two or three months. But every Saturday, I would make sure that I didn't have to work till four o'clock because I was going to the hip hop shop every Saturday. So every Saturday for me was, and this is early 20s, was um, 
St. Andrews Hall on Friday night. Um, Saturday, uh, Hip Hop Shop. Tuesday, Ebony Showcase. And is then anybody that knows Showcase is a fuck. I gotta battle him tonight. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, that's what happened. I started battling, and then in the, the Hip Hop Shop, the first battle that we had there, I won it. But what we was doing, Proof was taking names and he was putting them in a hat. Like, you, if you want to sign up to battle, you just put your name in the hat. He picks a name, picks another name. So it'd be like yeah. Bizarre versus B-flat. And then they'd go at it. And it was, you know, and then me versus whoever. I remember one time I battled Conniver, who was in my group, D12. But we weren't a group yet. Mm -hmm. I battled, yeah, yeah. Vaughn. And, um, and then I just started, like, I met a few people that got me out of just Detroit and I started going to I went to like 97 scribble jam and I went all the way to the end and then I lost to this guy named juice who to this day is still a really good fucking rapper and I think that it's he's so good that it's okay that I lost to him you know what I'm saying but well, uh, is he, is he still in Detroit rapping no this was uh this was Cincinnati yeah yeah the scribble jam was in Cincinnati, that was 97. And then I, from there I met Wendy Day and she put me on her battle team. Uh, she had this battle team that was, it was a, an event in LA called the Rap Olympics. And um, she put me on that team. I went out to LA and then started, got in that battle at the Rap Olympics, went all the way to the end and lost again, mm -hmm. the last dude. And I was like super discouraged. I just got evicted from my house. Had to break in through the <laughs> through the back of the house. Shit, yeah. The dude that we was paying rent to, he wasn't paying the rent with it. So one day we this is literally the the day before I go to the Rap Olympics that, that I and thank God for Wendy Day, man, because she played for my plane ticket. But <laughs> that day we're like, what the? F I come home from work, me and my boy, and we're like, what the fuck? All our shit is on the lawn. I, oh, I know that Fuck. very well. So, yeah, yeah so... Lawn, the, the eviction, man, and they decorated your fucking lawn with your furniture. Yeah, you and people was outside. rummaging through you it and shit. You gotta wait outside for nobody to take your shit. Yeah, yep, so that happened, and then I had to break into the back because I had nowhere to stay, so I had to break into the house through the back window, which was my old window. Broke in, slept on the floor, got up the next day, went to the Rap Olympics, and, and by the first prize was $500. And I needed that $500, man, and I lost. And I was like, f I was fucking devastated. And then this kid, Dean Geislinger, walks up to me and he's like, he's like, yo, man, you got one of those CDs? And I was like, yeah. And I kind of just tossed it to him, right? And didn't think nothing of it. I didn't know that Dean worked with Jimmy Iovine. Mm -hmm. So he gave it to Jimmy, Jimmy gave it to Dre, and I'm back in Detroit now, fucked right <laughs> I have nothing like nowhere to go um and i get the call and i'm like oh shit you know this is about to happen wow it was fast it didn't seem fast did it to you huh it's nah i did fast. not yeah nah. yeah <laughs> nah but um i just gotta say like i i i bro you you are like a god to me like I, I i bro you you've done so much in your life man it's like just so crazy to be the heavyweight champion at 20 20 years old well you're not chopped liver yourself i'm just saying <laughs> what i'm saying though but I, i'm just saying man like like I, I i don't know it takes a lot to be the champ like it takes a lot and and you know i remember seeing the first like the first couple fights when I was when I was younger, when you were first like mm -hmm. starting to really pop, I had heard about yo, you seen this guy Mike Tyson? Man, he's knocking motherfuckers out in ten seconds. Like and the first fight I saw was um which one was the first fight I saw? I think it was with Trevor Burbank. Eighty six, something like and that. And man, you knocked him down three times with one punch. <laughs> like I was like, what the fuck? And ever since then it was like it was like, when you fight, somebody's getting knocked out. It's just a matter of what round. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and like it, it comes from humble beginnings. You know, I have to. I had to. Um, in order to be the champ, I had to. I had to get beaten a couple of times. Yeah. I had to learn. Yeah. Yeah, boxing is hard, man. It's hard. Like, I, I've been boxing for like 13 years, just sparring, just messing around. I mess around with Emmanuel Stewart. Oh, and he's, he's the best. Yeah. He's the best. Yeah, man. He had all the champions back then. Yeah. Kronk Jim was, was just so fucking. Uh, just, man, everybody was coming down here to see the fighters and stuff. Yeah. Emmanuel Lewis had all the celebrities coming down here. He, oh, he was the man back then. Yeah, man. Yeah, he was such a nice dude, and he would come over. He'd come over to my house, and we'd spar like twice a week. He'd bring his boxers from the Crunk Gym. Ooh. I knew and, uh, Ricky Womack. Yeah, they were really great fighters. Yeah, that, yeah, this was... I remember the amateur when we were fighting for the Olympics. Those guys were really great fighters. Yeah. Yeah, man, and, and Emmanuel was like, he would... This was like 12, 13 years ago, right? So he would he would come over. He would show me the basics. And it took a lot for me to look. It took a long fucking time for me to just learn the basics, right? So then he started, like, a, after a couple months of us doing it. And they were just, like, you know, up-and-coming kids and stuff. Like, they would, you know, and just, you want to spar with them. And they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> I got a funny little story. So he's bringing his boxers. And this is, we're probably, like, six months in. And he's bringing his boxers, like, every week, right? And I'm getting my ass whipped, but I'm... At least I'm staying with him, right? I'm getting some good hits exactly. in. I feel a little yeah. bit good about myself. So one day, he comes over, and he brings his boxer from Crunk. And I'm in the house, and I remember, like, I was on the phone or something. So when I came out, the dude that he brought had his headgear on, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, okay, I guess he's ready. So I put my strap on my headgear, and we're going at it, and he kicked the shit out of me. <laughs> Fuck me up. <laughs> so after we're done, we go like three rounds, right? I don't think I got one hit in. After three rounds, he takes off his fucking headgear. And I said, man, how old are you? He said, 14. <laughs> I was like, man, I fucking quit. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, you know, it's, just, um, it's funny when you say that because some fighters just... um. They mature early. They may at fourteen, fifteen. They may be the best they ever been, and they're not good anymore. Yeah, that's just how it is in life with people. They they mature. They um, they peak at a certain age. I peaked at like in my twenties and stuff. Some people peak in their thirties. Some people peak in their teens. It's just weird. I feel like if you hit me, I would probably die. <laughs> like right now, like I still feel like you can. I still feel like you could get in there and just fuck people up. Wow, listen, you feel that way, and I don't have, and I don't even have that in me anymore. I don't even have the, the mentality to, to feel like I have to fucking kill everybody's family and stuff. I just don't have that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I still feel like you still look like you could punch a fucking brick wall and put a hole in that bitch. Yeah. I saw recently, we, Nani was showing me um, the uh, a video you did where you was just fucking around and you was trying to show these dudes yeah, how to. to do the, I think it was a body punch. Yeah. 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 And how you jump to the side real quick, <laughs> jump to the other side. Like, man, he could get in there right now and fuck up anybody. Well, because yeah. with a lot of people, you say, Mike, let's fight. <laughs> he just <laughs> believe that, you know, you can fight at any age, any age fighting. Fighting, yes, you can do forever if you have the desire to do it. Fighting's all about spirit. If you want to do it, you can do it at any age. Yeah. But it's like, but, but nobody, nobody knocked people out in the way that you did. Like people, people got knocked out by other fighters, but it was like when they got knocked out by you, they got knocked the fuck out. Yeah, that's how I looked at it. Every time I hurt somebody and knocked them out, my life gets better. Yeah, my life gets better. And yeah, gets better. And so I love hurting people now. Yeah, because my life is getting better, and I'm getting the fucking girls, I'm getting the mansion, I'm getting the planes, I'm getting the boats, I'm getting whatever I want. So hurting is beautiful, and yeah. my per perception of my life at the time. Yeah, but it's like to 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 be a fighter though. It's like you gotta. It takes a special kind of person. It takes a special kind of commitment. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Commitment is um. It's almost like you almost have to give your happiness up to accomplish your goals. Right. Cause you're gonna um, when you do it in anything, if you want to be the best garbage can collector in the world, anytime you want to be the best in the world at anything, there's gonna be disappointment. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of competition, 
And there's going to be guys that peak at a younger age that you, he's going to blow you away when he's a kid. And then you're going to deal with a guy that blows you away when he's an old guy. Yeah. And then it's going to come the time when you're experienced enough, the next thing you know, you start blowing everybody. If everybody gets their turn. Yeah. You know, that's just what it is. Everybody gets their turn. Yeah, but it's like, you're, you're right, though. Because, like, like, for me, rap is like a 24-7 job, and it takes a lot of dedication, right? And you just stay sharp with the pen and stuff like that. But it just takes, it's a different kind of discipline to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, and the, and the, and the, and the balls to get in the ring and fight in the first place. That, listen, you know why I, 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 I used to love anybody that gets in the fucking ring, because you just think about it. As human beings, what fighters do, we avoid all of our life getting into a fight. And that's what a guy does every day of his life. He fights every day of his life, and we avoid that shit. Yeah. It's humiliating if you're not on the right side, and if you don't know how to fight and then you still win, it's humiliating. Yeah. You know, you're going to get hurt. You know, right. so um, f people avoid fighting. You know, yeah. it's just, it's not normal. People are not supposed to fight. People are not structured to fight. Our hands are not developed to fight. Even for a boxer, they break. That's why we have to wrap them up and everything. We just not, human beings are not designed to fight. Yeah. But we do it all, it's just part of our DNA. To kill one another is just DNA, who we are is part of our, any form of murder is, is a form of self-hate. Yeah. You know? When you kill another person, it's just it's you reflecting on yourself how you feel about yourself. Yeah, it's interesting though. It's like you know, boxing is just like a, like coming up when I was a kid, I got my ass kicked a lot. I fought, I lost, I fought, I won. You know what I'm saying? And it was, it was, and I, and, and there was a time, there was a point in time where I started getting in enough fights and winning enough fights that I felt confident until I started learning some of the fundamentals of boxing, and I'm like, yeah. I don't know shit. I know nothing. Like, listen, um, we all believe in here that if you get involved with boxing, it's a tough man's sport. Boxing's not a tough man's sport. A tough guy's going to get hurt in boxing. He's going to talk funny at the end of the day. Yeah. No one's going to understand him. This is a thinking man's sport. Only the smartest win. Yeah. When you get a certain level, yeah. only the smartest win. A tough guy's not, this is not a tough man's sport. Yeah. No, I said, I, look, man, I, I, I also know you got a heart. So it's like you fuck somebody up and then feel bad later. Yeah. And you'd be like, because, I, you know, you'd be nice to him after the fight. Like, I don't like I hate you during this fight and then I don't hate you anymore. And I actually feel bad because you might die now. That's who we are. That's um, no, that's our fear. Yeah. We're like that, we're vicious, we're ferocious because the, the fact that we lost before and we've been disappointed before, we don't want that feeling anymore. Yeah. The, the fact, the thought that we got to go back to Brownsville, you have to go back to Seven Mile, that fucking fear, that's, that's our biggest fear, to go back where we started. Yep. Oh, yeah. Subconsciously, that's our biggest fear. Yep. And have to see those people who we grew up with and say, hey, I made it and I fucked up, I'm back here with these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Milton Burrow used to tell I used to, um, I had lost a fight and I, I was depressed and Milton Burrow said, what the hell are you depressed for? You know, doing bad is going back to Brownsville. <laughs> you, you made $30 million. Why are you depressed? Yeah. He is, he is, he, 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 these old Jewish guys, these old Zillian guys can't understand why these guys lose a fight for $30 million or $20 million and now he's crying. Yeah, you know, he, he just couldn't understand. He said, "If I want to watch, he never went to the fight. He said, if I want to watch two millionaires fight, I just watch. I just, I used to get out of my house in Beverly Hills. Yeah, they fight <laughs> right. Hey, but like, I want to say you. You say we really, enter, we really entertain your, um, your emerging in rap. We thought that was beautiful. Everybody, all nationalities and everything. We had to, we had to say you are the best. You put, you put it down. We watch you." Battle, we watch you not battle them, but we watch you um, compared with the best. We watch you do songs with Jay Z. We watch you do all those guys, and you got really ill. Oh, thank you, man. You really thank you. Ill. you and, yeah, one of those songs he said, Yeah, you saw me before. I just didn't have all these swords before. But you say you had armed with these guns and swords before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you met me before. Oh, yeah, yeah, you just didn't have all these guns and swords before. Yeah, I don't have all these. Arsenal the weapons before yeah. Marshall was step in the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the Biggie song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. fucking listen. 
Are you conscious that you know you're rapping like J and B? You know you gotta blaze, right? You know you gotta put it down, cause if you don't put it down, people gonna say, "Oh, nigga, he shitting on you." I mean, that's how I feel. Anytime I get on a song with anybody, yeah, it's like, that. man, if I don't try to like, I have to, you know, just having that hunger still and trying to like, like you said, it, it, it's it's not about it's not about the money all the time, right? Okay. So it's like when you when you lose a fight and you get depressed, it's because your competitive nature and your competitive spirit is wounded, right? Because it's, you're, it's the reason that we started doing this because we're not good enough. It goes in your mind. Yep. We're not good enough. Yep. He's better than me and it fucking kills you. Yep. Somebody's better than you and you believe in your head that you're God or you're the best or whatever you believe you are. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, man. Yo, you was dope in the hangover. That, hey, listen, man, I was just very happy to do that. I was like 280 pounds. I was on cocaine. I was I was just doing I had my prostitute girlfriends at the, at the fucking, and, and this, what is this, the trailer with me? I was just living the fucking life back then. <laughs> I had, listen, when I did the hangover, I didn't know I went to the club. And, you know, the clubs in Vegas, they let me in all the private stuff, you know. And so when I went in this private spot, I saw these white people in these white crew, and I was looking at these people. But then I saw those two girls. What's those two girls, the two twins? What's their name? The oh, really I forgot. They're really rich. The Owen, what's the... Owen twins? Olsen twins? Olsen twins. Olsen twins. So yeah. I saw the two Olsen. I saw one. I saw. I saw one of the Olsen twins that there with these guys, and I'm in the. And it's, it's just open. It's closed to them. And then the guy, the bodyguard, let me in. The guy, the bodyguard for the club, because he knows me all the time. I would yeah. give him money, and he lets me in, and we're chilling and stuff. We're coked up, and we're drinking. And then they look at me, and they, and somebody comes over and say, "Hey." We're doing a movie with you in two weeks. We're doing a movie with you. I said, when? He said, in two weeks. I said, fuck, I didn't know that. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, I said, fuck, I didn't know that. And so I'm going, I'm on this movie. I'm doing this set and stuff. And um, I'm just a mess back then. So I do this movie. And I don't think this movie is shit. You know, I'm, a, I'm high all the time. And then I'm in a restaurant. I come out the restaurant. You see one of those buses, you know, the tour bus? They see me, they must have went to the movie and saw the preview because the movie wasn't out yet. Yeah. And then when they saw me, it must have been like 30, but they all got off the bus and said, we love you, we saw you in the movie. And then my friend Zip, who's not, no longer with he said, hey, we got something here, we're back. <laughs> ah. <laughs> we're back. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's been a rap ever since, and um, Todd Phillips been my friend. He, and he and I was out in the club, I don't know what club I was at, but it was a movie theater, and I went there, and everybody was all over me, and the, the guy that, Produced Hangover, Todd Phillips, who did the Joker. He looked and he said, "Listen, I'm, I feel proud because I feel I, I'm a part of this." Because he saw everybody coming up to me. He said, "He said yeah. I feel like I'm a part of this." That you know, he was proud that he said, everybody was coming up to me. And then next thing you know, he was. Oh, I can't even tell you what we're doing next, but anything. It's just um, we became good friends. We became That's dope. That's dope, man. Yeah, it's dope too because like, like I, you know. I was like, holy shit, Mike can act. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and then seeing the uh, the Undisputed, yeah. man, and hearing you tell them stories that I'm like, I so want to know about this. Yeah. You know what Everybody I'm saying? Everybody knew the story, but they didn't know the underlying yeah. behind the story. Why did I do that? Yeah. Hell it's yeah. Getting ready and to do round two. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the round two is so much better than round one. We did this all. Uh, listen, this is really interesting. How do you do this? <laughs> I knew you had to do it. So I'm on the show and I said, good night. And it's 4,000 people. And when I say good night in Toronto, they all get up and they come to the stage. And they just want to touch me. And I, and I don't know what to do. The security's not doing that. I, <laughs> right. do. I, I don't want these people to think I'm scared and run off. But I want to run. But so I just get caught in it. It was just overwhelming and shit that people think that way about you. And in my mind, I always had a low self-esteem. I said, if these people think much about me, they must not be shit. You know what I mean? Because why would you think about me? Because I don't yeah. think I'm shit. Yeah. You know? I went through a lot of that shit, too, growing up as a kid and just feeling like I wasn't good enough for anything. Like, whatever I did, I just wasn't good enough. And, uh, yeah, man, it's a psychological thing, I think, mm -hmm. that once you... For, for, 
for for anybody who who doesn't feel who feels like that right like i just feel like i'm not i'm worthless i'm not nothing in this world anybody who feels that and then find something that they're actually good at it's like a i think that's that's what makes somebody go for that so hard you know what i'm saying yeah like i'm never good at i was never good at nothing i'm good at this you know most the most successful people that ever lived in history are megalomaniacs but they got a low self-esteem yeah they don't think much about this stuff, but they think they're God on the other hand, too. Right. You know, but those are the most successful people. They're always challenging that doubt. Yeah. Making that doubt um, inconceivable. That's not true. But they still believe it's doubt. Right. Even though they prove that it, it doesn't stop them from succeeding, but they still they still challenge that and it still bothers them. They still believe they're nothing. If they made billions of dollars, they still feel they believe they're not shit. That's just how the mind fucks with us. Yeah, people also think too, like money just buys happiness and it absolutely is not the truth. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like you gotta be right inside. Otherwise none of that shit means nothing. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They get everything, then this is this is something, this is everything. Fuck this. Pow! Mm -hmm. This is everything? I waste my fucking life for this? This is yeah. everything? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, M, you just blew the fucking roof off the Oscars. How'd that feel? Man. <laughs> Do you, hey, are you surprised that they still ask you to come? Actually, I thought it was the fucking dopest thing I've seen in a long time, dude. Thanks, man, but, I, but I'm going to tell you why I'm making that face. <laughs> okay. Because when I went out there... Everything was cool, right? I I'm, I go through the first verse, and you know they 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 had the pack where your uh, the mic pack yeah the mic pack yeah that you wear you know the clip onto your belt and then you got the in ears that go in your in in your ears right so you can hear the sound, and I'm rapping and all of a sudden I see between my legs. <laughs> The motherfucking pack swinging. Oh, what the fuck? fuck. Oh, so I'm fuck. like this, trying to grab that shit. I don't know what they showed on TV and what they didn't. But man, I was like, so then I tried to stick that bitch in my, and I'm like, wow, I got no pockets back here. Fuck. Oh, so I'm rapping fuck. the lyrics while I'm doing this, and then I'm like, man, let's put it in my front pocket. Fuck it. By that time, the song's over. Oh. And I'm like, man, what the fuck? <laughs> we rehearsed for that shit. I know the words to lose yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. But we rehearsed that shit extra, extra, extras just so we didn't fuck that up. Oh. And then that was the one thing we didn't plan for. And of course it went wrong. And I'm like, mother fuck. Which nobody's saying. Yeah, dude. Nobody saw that. <laughs> really? Nobody saw it. No, you killed uh, it, bro. You fucking killed no, thanks, that. Thanks, man. Dude. Thank you. Hell yeah. Thank you. I, I thought it was amazing. I, yeah, yeah, I, had, I ain't watched it because I got creeped out. I'm like, I don't want to fucking see this shit. I'm going to just get angry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Girl, dude, how old oh, is she? Fuck. Uh, Haley is um, 23. What's that? What's that? Like, she has boyfriends and stuff? She has babies? She Not babies. Nope. Just um, boyfriend. Yeah. Fuck. And, um, yeah. She's doing, she's, she's, she's doing good. She's, she's made me proud for sure. She graduated from college, 3.9. Wow, good yeah. for her, man. Yeah, thank That's you. That's awesome. How does that feel? You have a 23-year-old. I was just listening to Slim Shady. Yeah. And listening yeah, to it's, that. It's, it's, it, it, it definitely is crazy. It definitely is crazy. I have a, I have a, a niece that I had, have helped raise too that's kind of like a daughter pretty much like a daughter to me wow. and she is 26 and then i have a younger one that's 17 now so when i think about my accomplishments like that's probably the thing i'm the most proud of you know is that is being able to raise kids you know most guys like us that are successful and stuff that supposedly have it all our kids are fucked up you know yeah fucked up they, they never had the life that we had they never struggled they never know struggle without struggle there's no progress yep. you know, and that's why they don't progress because they don't struggle yeah yeah it's definitely important to to keep your kids grounded when there's situations like we have right yeah, it's like absolutely. it's very yeah. important yeah. yeah well hey brother thanks for coming in really? you, know, you got to get back to your shoot it's all good man I'm I'm so honored 
did you would even think to do this, man. I'm, we I'm, love you, nigga. Dude, you're the fucking man, bro. <laughs> oh, Come on. We love you, Yeah, man. but like I said, man, I, I, can't, I can't. You know, I told you I was going to fan out fan out on you, and if it gets love weird, you. just stop me. <laughs> it's all good, <laughs> man. We love but your motherfucking Mike Tyson, man. Your motherfucking Eminem. It, listen, Eminem, listen, let me tell you something, right? I've been to, let me tell me, I've been to Detroit for the... Um, all star, I remember we had all star some shit in Detroit, and I remember I've been in Detroit. We had a fort in Detroit. But you know how? Listen, so, and I'm from Brownsville that's similar to Detroit. What's the possibility of you being a seven mile from seven mile? Now you here. Now what's that? How? What's the what's the percentage that that? Happens? That's what I think. What's the? How do a guy in seven miles get out here? How do you get out here and you don't got shit? And you're not and you're destitute. Yeah. You know mm. how did that happen? Because it's ordained by the universe. Mm. Me and this guy, man, Denon went through a lot of shit. Like when we were I when I, I we were kids ourselves, right? And we were still look when I met Denon, he had just started making beats. And mm. we met through a through a mutual friend, IQ, who was a rapper who was actually on my infinite album. And IQ introduced us, and then we, man, we we grinded until, like, he went through a lot of this. We went through a lot of the same things together coming up, right? So it was like, we, and we did it together. We worked the same job. We were roommates. We had, you know what I'm saying? We lived in houses together. Your guys' Let's success go. became because of your lifestyle. Success and fame, all that stuff comes from lifestyle. You know, I changed my lifestyle. I stopped getting high. I stopped drinking. I stopped everything. I stopped fucking girls. Matter of fact, I never had no girl when I was boxing. Yeah. I was too young. I didn't have a girl until I was like 19, 18 years old. You know, but um, that's all I focused on. That's why I didn't want any days. Wanted to fight. All, all I did was watch fights all day. Just from guys from 1890 to now. Just yeah. Watched them all day. That's all I did because that's all I wanted to be. Yeah. That's all I knew. I knew all the etiquette about fighting and everything. Anything you ask me about fighting, I could tell you. How did it begin? How did it start? I knew everything about fighting. Yeah. I remember what was it? I saw a documentary where Customato used to make you, he would call out numbers. Oh, yeah, the Wooly. Yeah. <laughs> the Wooly? Like, man, I could never, I'll never live to do that. <laughs> that shit is, that shit was crazy. Yeah, he was crazy. But he was <laughs> crazy. Yeah. You know, a lot of his fighters left him because he's so overbearing. He's oh. so perfected. And if you're allowed to stay, you have to be crazy, too, to be with this man. Because I wanted to be the best so bad. Yeah. And only he could do it. Nobody could, nobody, and no one could inspire me like him. I'm one of those guys. I'm a, I'm a dark person. I come from a dark world. So oh. nobody, certainly no white motherfucker. No one could inspire me like him. He inspired me to be better than what I was. There's no way I was going to be. If I was Mike Tyson... Badass motherfucker from Brownsville, Brooklyn. I still wouldn't have made it because um, that was just Brownsville, Brooklyn. He made me believe I was the I was the best fighter the world has ever produced. Yeah, but you did it though. Yeah, but you did it, and you were um, the but, best fighter. Yeah, but that, but in life that's not a good way to think. And fighting is great, but in life it's reckless. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. To mm. be successful in one field is disastrous in another field. Right. Yeah. Like with you, you were great in rap, but in life you were kind of shaky. Yeah. You know? Oh, I was shit. I, yeah, um, I have an eighth grade education. I, uh, you know, I. No, it, it has nothing to do with the education. It was the pressure. All of a sudden, boom, they're in your face. And they judge, people are judging you. And you got a low, we have a little weird self esteem anyway. Now people are judging us, saying things about it, and we get defensive. And when we get defensive, we, we play into their game. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yep. But still, even though we do that, this gives us our attention, and we get reputations for being crazy and unstable and drug addicts and stuff, and then we go through the whole recovery thing. I will, oh, listen, the best thing that ever happened to me, I got involved with the recovery program because I met great people, but uh, I'm a, um, what am I, you know what I am? I am a, I am a relapse specialist. You know, I, I just have to relapse. Even if I'm five years straight, then I relapse. And my relapse is like, my relapse starts with thinking or me jerking off a lot of something. You know, no, that's just, that just stopped me off. 
That's yeah. I start looking at my porn, then I start jerking off, and then I start looking at fucking prey. Then I look at people who I never thought about fucking and stuff who's real close to me, and that's just who I am. You know what I mean? Those are my those are my habits and those are my flaws and shit. Mm. Yeah. Oh, the people around me, man. My people think I'm fucking nuts. I'm, <laughs> yeah. No, I usually feel sorry for the people who are not nuts that are around you. Yeah. If you're not if you're not crazy in this crazy world. I really feel sorry for you. Yeah, I think my circle of friends is definitely somewhere in the ballpark of my insanity. There's no Just doubt to be about friends it. with me. Um. It's, it's, how do we live in this world? How do we find out our, our purpose? You're born, and most of us are born fucking in a bad situation. And then we say, wow, what's wrong with us? Why are we here? Mm -hmm. Why did they put us here? Why are we are not living like these people and stuff? And these people look down on us. And when we're around these people, these people can call the cops on us, and the cops won't listen to us and listen to those people. Yeah. And then you start saying, hey, I'm garbage, I'm nothing. Life proves, life showing me that I'm nothing. And then you run into somebody who you think is sudden and he tells you great things about yourself. And then you think you're great because this great guy told you great things about yourself. And then the whole perspective of your confidence goes to another level. Proof. That's how proof was to me. Yeah, yeah man. He was, a, he was a godsend to me because he, I know that I would not have made it without knowing him. Because he gave me, like, not, I mean, he, he, he co-signed for me when I went to the shop, when I went to Ebony Show, because he co-signed for me everywhere I went, and people respected him. His name meant something because they respected him, because he that's was the Cus, crazy. Listen, listen, when Cus told those South African guys, hey, say, listen, we have a black young man in this house. He's our family. You treat him the way you treat us. And he told everybody around there, all those white guys, he has all these guys with power policy. This is our son. This is the, and nigga, my head was so big. He shouldn't have did He never told me I was a nigga that you're not going to make. He always said I was superior than everybody. You know, isn't that a trip? He told me I'm better than everybody. And the reason why those people are bothering me because they're jealous of you. <laughs> he never had put doubt in my mind that I was fucked up. Even though I believed that, he she just shattered that and made me a, in my mind. I thought of myself a demigod. It's crazy because that's the one thing you needed. That's yeah, the absolutely. one thing you needed in your life I, to no feel doubt. like you was special. No, that's doubt. how proof made me feel. My, it was my, like, my confidence mm. was so low. I had such a low self-esteem. I was just a criminal. When I first met Cuss and I saw his house, I'ma rob these white motherfuckers. <laughs> and then he gave me, and then he um, how he kept talking to me and gave me self esteem, and then he made me want to be his wife. So if anybody said anything about him, I would kill them. I believe you. Hmm. No, I'm saying I believe you. I believe he you. had my mind just like that. If anybody disrespected him, he made me feel something. He made me feel like something I never felt before. And I said, um, if anybody disrespected him, I would fucking kill them. That's just how. Yeah, I man. Because in the ghetto, that's how you show your love, by killing somebody or hurting somebody for somebody. Yeah. Yep. Mm. I got to ask you, when you was going into, like, them early fights, right, when you first started coming up, when you walk into the ring, what, like, what that, what is that shit like? Um, it's really orgasmic. It's almost like, um... Like you felt, did like, did you feel like part of you nervous, like tense, but the other part, like you're gonna kill I'm somebody? Just, no, I'm not nervous, I'm scared. Ah. I'm scared. Yeah. Cause I'm a scary guy. Cause I've been picked on in my life. I've been abused all my life. People did anything they wanted to me. So I have natural fear of not being safe. Yeah. That's just my, that's who I am, natural. It's, no, it's in my life, that's who I am. So now I got it with this, weird self-confidence and violence and stuff. So now I'm sadistic because I'm afraid I'm gonna get hurt. Yes. I'm an animal now. Yeah, so it's like I gotta, I gotta hit this guy. I gotta hurt this guy before he hurts me. Absolutely. Yeah. And not only do I have to do it, I have to do it spectacularly for more people who want to see me do it again. And more, more people I, did. The more I hurt them, the more spectacularly I hurt them, the better my life would be. Yep. And that's how my mindset was. That's crazy, though. Cuss loved hurting people, other fighters. He loved breaking their ribs, their, their eye sockets, their cheekbone. He just loved, he, he, he just wanted to see how people work under those circumstances. Yeah. 
And uh, I just I just never seen nobody like hit so hard before. Like I don't like that's gotta be something like like what is that? Like you No, know, um I got credit for my punching speed, but it wasn't my punches it wasn't my punching power that it was the accuracy. And yeah. I was fast, so I got the I got the punch there before the other the other the hard punches got there. You know, some guys are hard like Foreman's a hard puncher but he just pounds you, hits you in the shoulder, hits your arm, and it fucks you up. I mean, so I'm precise. I'm hitting you here. I mean, everywhere I hit you is the reason. And normally, I get the right results most of the time. Yeah, it's like like the way you sit down on your punches, and when you well, throw those hooks to the body yeah, and the shit. Objective for the guy don't see the punch. Those are the punches that knock you out. Yeah. You know. That's crazy though. Hell yeah. Well, dude. Yeah, I really, think you gotta hit back. Listen, man, can I tell you something? This is really good. We know you don't do this stuff. Yeah. And this is really cool. I mean, you don't have to thank me, man. It's equal. Like, you coming here is, like, such a big... We was, like, we were talking about it, and it was in the treatment. Mike Tyson knocks him, knocks him out. And I'm like, we're not going to get Mike Tyson. We can't get Mike Tyson. I'm like, if we get Tyson, like, that's the top of the fucking food chain. Well, that's, that's, the how, <laughs> that's how we feel about you. We feel yeah, like, God, this is the biggest fucking interview. And I had interviewed everybody. Tony Robbins, all these fucking interesting guys and stuff. But this is the best one. But this might be my biggest <laughs> interview right here. Yeah. yeah, man. You're the man, dude. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you, man. And you're not no guy somebody gave anything. Everything you got was fucking not even giving you fucking slave for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You yeah, you you the only white guy that knows what it's like to be a nigga. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how to answer that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, nah, man, it's uh. One of the few white guys that know that pressure, like fuck, I ain't shit. They ain't doing me like they treating me like a fucking nigga. I mean, he probably said the fuck, fuck, black get treated better than me. I mean, you know, we all got our story. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah. But yeah, man, I, I'm I'm super honored. I, I I can't believe we were able to get you for this video. It's oh a, man, that's awesome, man. Everything, it's a fucking man, honor. Everything, everything in life is, is you know, it's, it's just always mapped out from our birth to our death. It's this is how it's ordained to be. It's planned to be. This. Way. Tell us about being. Marshall's sober. too humble to feel? be. Huh? How's that feel being sober? We can't. Being sober. We don't have time. We don't have time. Look at him. He looks I'm used, great. I'm used to it now. Hey. But it hey was everybody. hard at first. Thanks for watching this episode of Hot Boxing. <laughs> Thank you to Eminem. Thank you to our brother here for joining. Yeah, man. Um, until next time, I'm Evan Britton. I'm Mike Tyson. I'm Marshall Mathers. And if we didn't have to do a video right now, I'd be sitting here probably asking, like, questions for another two hours. We'll do it again. we do it again. We'll, we'll do it two. again, Part bro. two. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Oh. I'm going to get you the picture with you guys. I want a picture too.